She made our life absolutely miserable. She came out, she probably weighed 300 pounds, she was very tall. She screamed at them, I don't want them here, take them back to Auschwitz. And the two German soldiers stood in front of her, they clicked their heels, they gave the Nazi salute, they turned around, they walked out of the, uh, the camp and left us there. So if it wouldn't be for two German soldiers whose names we never learned, I wouldn't be standing here to tell you my story. We worked in that factory for quite a while. We got there, I don't know when, in Auschwitz and in those camps you didn't know time or dates. But my guess is we arrived there towards the end of January. 45, and we worked very hard. We had to, t I was with Bushy and Stenner in transport. We had to unload the cattle cars. We had to unload the freight trains. We had to unload the coal. And we had to load it on trucks, and we were the horses. There were no horses. We had to push these trucks into the factory. But Bushy and Stenner and Hannah and I helped each other. And Hannah worked in the factory, in the spinnery, where the raw material of flax was turned into yarn. And she and some of her friends stole some of the raw flax, and we made warmers from them, and put them under our thin shifts and into our clogs. And we were, at night, we got back very late from work, and we found things at the railroad station in the garbage. And once I found a big piece of meat on a bone, I have no idea what it came from, but we took it into the factory and we washed it under the uh, showers and we ate it and we didn't get sick. <coughs> and one day, the door to the dormitory was opened by a German soldier. And he said, ladies, we were looking for the ladies, we were only used to horrible words we, which were thrown at us. You are free. Well, we didn't, we didn't believe it. And he was gone. We had heard a lot of commotion in the camp. All the camp people, the Nazis, had fled during the night. And we were left in the camp and the Russians came in, and they were wonderful to us. The officer in charge was a very educated man, and he tried to take care of the, of the sick. And we had a baby in the camp. That baby was delivered a few days before liberation. The mother was pregnant, but she was so emaciated she didn't show that she was pregnant, mm. or she would have been killed. And we were sure that this little boy would not make it. And it was only years later that I got a letter from a kibbutz in Israel that these two ladies made it. They were in Australia, and their little boy, who I thought was doomed, has a PhD in chemistry. <laughs> Bushy and <coughs> Hannah and Stenner and I stuck together, but only Bushy and I were strong enough to bicycle. 
They were all too weak, and they couldn't do it. Even though we got all the encouragement from two people who were very important to me, they were prisoners of war. They worked at the railroad station, and they encouraged us constantly. But we didn't believe them anymore, because they kept saying to us, the Russians are very close, you're going to be liberated, but it, they never came. And finally, they did. The two bicycles that Bushy and I got from the Russian officer, he took them away from the Germans who were fleeing. And he tried them out first. And if he didn't like them, he threw them in the ditch. And he stopped the next cart that's of fleeing Germans. They took us to the west. But Germany would never be home for me again. They had murdered my father. They had murdered my brother. They had murdered my friends. I would not be able to ever live in Germany in the long run. I knew that. I had no idea what happened to my mother. I hadn't heard from her. No sign of life for over three years. So Bushy and I traveled in this war-torn Europe and eventually came to this little village called Lipborg, which my parents had designated, if we get separated, we are all going to meet here at Aunt Minchin's house, my mother's sister. So this was my goal. It's not that far from Holland. So Bushy and I bicycled for weeks and weeks and weeks. And we got our food very easily because the Russians had given us a little identification in Cyrillic language. I don't know what it said, but we used it in Germany, and we demanded to get food and shelter. It's a Russian order. And as soon as they heard Russian, we got a bed and we got food. <laughs> so we came, uh, you know, I can't go into more details, so we're here all night. We came close to Lipburg. This is a cobblestone street. It's very, very hilly. And we were pushing our bikes up Dorfstraße. And I saw a woman on a very narrow sidewalk. She was carrying a big load of wash. She had gray hair, totally gray hair. But I recognized her. I had remembered her with jet black hair. She was my mother. And she came over. She didn't embrace me at first. She looked behind me. She waited for her son and for her husband. And she said, Daddy and Walter are not coming back. And then she screamed, my child is back, my child is back. And the villagers came out of their houses. They knew <coughs> us. We had spent every vacation there. And everybody asked the same question. Where's your brother? Where's your father? We were in pretty bad shape, Bushi and I. And we were nursed back to, back to health. And it was strawberry season. And my aunt was wondering why she had such a very bad patch of strawberries this year, because we were eating them all. <laughs> we hadn't seen a strawberry for years. 